Well, this morning, we are going to uh, venture a little bit into educational psychology. Sounds like fun, right? Yeah. What? I think that was my daughter that said that, actually. So, um, Jean Piaget was born in Switzerland, Switzerland in 1896. He was a historian, professor, a history professor who was later turned child psychologist. And some have come to consider him perhaps the most influential of child psychologists who ever lived. Piaget proposed a theory of cognitive development that is how we learn to learn. He pr proposed this theory of cognitive development that describes what he called Cognitive disequilib disequilibrium. Got it? There will be a quiz later. <laughs> equilibrium, you know, is, I think we've all experienced that in our lives, equilibrium. And when we don't have equilibrium, it's a little disconcerting, right? If your inner ear is affecting you or something. So we understand what equilibrium is. And uh, like a rowboat on a calm lake, there's equilibri equilibrium in a rowboat that's sitting on a calm lake, but then if you've ever experienced it, I mean, some of you guys, you're out there fishing in your little boat, things are smooth, the fish are biting, and then comes this jet ski, <laughs> shredding up the water and creating big waves, and your boat's doing like this and scaring all the fish away, and that is a state of disequilibration. When... All you hope for is to kind of get back to the settled place of calm, of equilibrium. Cognitive equilibrium is the natural tendency to maintain a balance between what one already knows and what one experiences. So there's, there's what we know to be true, and there's what we experience. When what we experience lines up with what we know, it's a calm lake. Everything's good. But when we experience something that doesn't fit inside of our cognitive framework, what we know, there's anxiety and discomfort and confusion. We are disequilibrated. When faced with these new experiences, we can either interpret our experiences based on what we know or we can adjust our beliefs to align with our experiences. So let me give you an example. When I say the word dog, I imagine that right now as I said that word, you have an image that popped into your head what a dog is. You know what I mean, right? You, but now imagine that you're a three-year-old. Your whole realm of experience is golden retriever. That's dog. That's the only frame of experience you have. So when somebody says dog, the picture that comes into their mind is a golden retriever, and that's all they know. Now suppose I invite that three-year-old over, and they come to my house to see my dog. They're expecting to see a golden retriever, but perhaps I introduce them to my new dog, which I don't actually have. But imagine this was my new dog. Or maybe this one. That's like an Afghan just walking around or something. Or perhaps this one. That looks like a sheep, right? Or this one. That looks like a Black Panther. I actually saw one of those in the back of a car oh, a few months ago. It's intimidating. <laughs> but it's totally outside of the framework of golden retriever, isn't it? So if your framework says dog is golden retriever, you go here and say, well, that's not a dog. So you have a choice to make. You have to decide. Are you going to broaden your understanding of dog, or do you just limit it to understanding dog as golden retriever and everything outside of that is something else? We try to systematize our world. We try to create mental frameworks for what we experience. But when we have new experiences that don't line up with what we know or what we at least believe to be true, we are knocked off balance. Again, imagine a balance beam and you're walking along on a balance beam and you're keeping your balance and somebody comes up to you and does this to you. What do you do? And you flail a little bit, try to get your balance back, right? All right, you've got it back, you're established again, what happens? Somebody else comes up, same guy, prankster friend of yours, thinks he's funny, he comes up again and he's going to push you. What do you do this time? 
you get a little lower, and you lean into it because you're ready for it, and he can't knock you off balance. So it can be very good to be disequilibrated because you learn to adjust. You learn to be ready. You learn to prepare for it, and you're able to make the adjustments, establish a stronger foundation so that you're not thrown off and fall down. But imagine that you don't adjust your thinking to the experience. The way you've framed your understanding of reality, you've decided to lock in. There's no budging. The picture that you have, that's the only picture there is. And so over the last few weeks, that's what we see from Jonah. He is committed to his belief that God's favor and mercy is extended first and foremost to God's chosen people, the Israelites. His view of reality was narrow. Jonah understood God's mercy, and he understood God's grace. He understood that that extended to the Israelites, but he couldn't grasp the possibility that there was a reality in which God's mercy and grace would extend to the nation, certainly not to the nation of Nineveh and the Assyrians, where these people persecuted God's chosen people. That was farthest thing from his mind. He was stuck in his way of thinking. Today we're going to wrap up our series in Jonah. And as we look at this final chapter, chapter, we're going to look at three times that Jonah is knocked off balance. When God gives Jonah a push, the question, of course, is how does Jonah respond? Does he stick with what he's believed or does he adjust his thinking to his new reality? So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jonah chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, there's a pew Bible in front of you. That's page 917 in the Pew Bible. And Jonah 4 begins with this. It says, But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. Well, what's this, of course, is the question that we're left with. If you're just starting in the book of Jonah and you pick it up and you turn there, you have to ask, what's the this? We, of course, know from last week what the this is. is seen in chapter 3 in verse uh, verse 10, where it says, When God saw what they, the Ninevites, did, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Nineveh turned from their evil ways. This foreign nation, these foreign people who were opposed to God, turned from their evil and turned to God. And because of that, God turned from his anger and his justice and relented and gave Nineveh a second chance. So push number one is this. God's turn made Jonah burn. Jonah chapter 4, 1 goes on to say that Jonah became very angry. And the literal term is there is that he was inflamed, he burned. Jonah's anger was a burning anger. Jonah's experience of God's mercy, it didn't line up with what he wanted to believe. He wanted to believe that God's justice would prevail and the Ninevites would be punished. Jonah's experience of God's mercy, it just didn't fit. It's not that it didn't line up with what he knew. It just didn't line up with what he wanted to be true. In Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, it says that Jonah prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? So you see there that he's had this conversation previously. We don't have it recorded in the book of Jonah. But he said that before, before he left and headed out to Tarshish. He says, isn't this what I said at home? That uh, you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sin and calamity. So Jonah understood in his head that God is a compassionate, gracious God. He understood that. But outside of his understanding, there was also this concept of mercy. But mercy was also his experience because there are two times in the book of Jonah that it says that Jonah prayed. And if you remember previously, the first time that Jonah prayed, it was from the belly of a well. A belly of the well in which he found himself because he had been perishing in the depths of the sea, in the darkness, in the chaos. The uh, picture of the grave. God had pulled him out of the grave, rescued him by a big fish. And in that belly, he calls out a prayer of thanksgiving. He was thankful for God's compassion, the compassion that God had shown him by delivering him from the darkness and the grave. 
And the same mercy that inspired Jonah's praise there that was extended to him is the same mercy that God extends to Nineveh, and now it causes Jonah to burn. Thanks, God, for your mercy. God, your mercy is unfair. You see the imbalance there? So here's God pushing Jonah, knocking him off balance. Jonah thought he understood it. He thought he had a picture of what it meant. But now he's going, can grace really extend to those people? Well, we see how Jonah responds in verse 3. It says, now, Lord, he says, take away my life. Again, he says, Kill me. I'd rather be dead than to pursue your mission. I'd rather be dead, Lord, than to see those people repent. My life is, I, is meaningless if those people come to faith in you. It's better for me to die than to live. Now, it doesn't really surprise us at this point in the book of Jonah as we come to chapter 4. I mean, we've seen this all along, that Jonah had fled the initial call. He ran the other way. He sought to live an incognito life where nobody knew what he was to do. Nobody knew what the expectations of a prophet were. He ran and he tried to hide. He preferred death at that point. And for a minute, though, in chapter 3, we saw what might be a glimpse because in chapter 3, he responds to God's call and he goes to Nineveh, albeit reluctantly. And then God's response at this point in Jonah chapter 4 is, why are you mad, bro? Well, okay, that's not exactly what he says. It says, is it right for you to be angry? I think the literal translation of Hebrew, though, is, why are you mad, bro? Why are you angry, Jonah? I can only imagine that this forces Jonah into some deep examination. So why am I mad? In the next verse, we read, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. Now, we may imagine that this is a point of quiet reflection, but this picture of east really isn't a picture that is a good picture throughout the Old Testament. Biblically, east isn't a good connotation. When you think of it, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, when they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, they were sent east from the garden. After Cain killed his brother, he settled east of Eden. There was a continuing progression from east of the garden to further east of the garden. The Tower of Babel then, as the people moved across the land and they established, trying to establish their own kingdom under their own rule, they moved east. They settled east. They migrated east. When Abraham and Lot separated to their respective lands, which way did Lot go? He went east. It's this continuing picture as you go east of moving away from God. Heading east depicts departure. It, it, it depicts, a, again, a running, in this case, of Jonah away from what God was calling him to do. It's not toward God, but it's away from God. He continues Jonah in his relentless resistance to God's mission to the nations. Verse 5 then says this. Jonah had gone out and sat down in a place of the east of the city. There he makes himself a shelter. He sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. What did he think would happen? I mean, God had already told him what would happen. He says, I'm not going to do anything. I've relented, and I'm going to extend mercy to him. But he's saying, oh, come on, God. You're messing with me, right? Destroy this city. Annihilate them. He sat, and he was waiting for something to happen, and nothing happened. He continued to hope that his understanding of how things in his mind should be would align with the, thing, the way things would be. But God, who was gracious and compassionate, continued to minister to the Ninevites, but he also continues to minister here to Jonah in his stubbornness. In verse 6 it says, The Lord provided a leafy plant, and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. Now, if you remember in Jonah chapter 1, it said that the Lord sent a great wind. And that word sent is appointed. God appointed a great wind. In Jonah 1.17, again, the Lord provided a huge or appointed a huge fish. Now here in chapter 4, God appoints a leafy plant continuing to remind us about who's in charge here, who's, who's responsible. God is the one who's making these appointments. 
And we don't know what kind of plant it was. It could have been a gourd. Perhaps Jonah lost his gourd. I'll be here all week. Maybe it was a vine. We don't know what kind of vine it was. We just know that God provided a plant. It's interesting that God provided a plant to provide shade, though, isn't it? Because what does it say? Jonah went out, he built himself a shelter, and he sat in the shade of the shelter. So why, God, would you need to build a shade if Jonah had already done it? Continuing to point us to the reality that our efforts to attain mercy and grace on our own all fall short. We do not build for ourselves our own shelters. God is the only one who can provide a shelter that is sufficient. Perhaps you've heard the definitions of grace and mercy. Grace is, is the idea that you're getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is the idea that you're not getting what you do deserve. Jonah deserved disobedience or deserved death for his disobedience. But God withheld death and destruction and gave him instead shade. He showed his grace by giving a plant. He showed his mercy by not destroying him. You see, God's grace is relentless even when our resistance is relentless. You see, he was willing to accept God's mercy and grace when it came to him. He's like, thanks, God. This is a really awesome plant. He was so excited. He was happy. Contrast that to his earlier response when the Ninevites received God's grace and mercy. He was burning with anger. See, when it comes to focusing on ourselves, that's what Jonah did. It was all about him and what he received. He could care less about what others might receive. He could care less if others received the gospel. He could care less if others experienced God's mercy and grace. All that mattered to him was that God was taking care of him. He was a consumer. How many of us are overjoyed by God's mercy towards us? Thank you, God, for your mercy. And we should be thankful for his mercy, yes. But not at the exclusion of mercy towards others. Jonah was angry to think that his enemies might receive God's mercy. How many of us are angry when we think that God's going to give mercy to them, those kind of people? How do you respond when things go well with your enemies? God, why did you give them that sweet car or that nice house or that great fortune? Why do they get all of the breaks and I left to struggle and strive and work? It's not fair. We often complain how children have an overdeveloped sense of justice, right? It's not fair. When we say the same thing, God, it's not fair that they should be successful and I have to work so hard. At this point, God's not finished. He pushes Jonah again, and we see it in verses 7 through 8. It says, at dawn the next day, God provided again a pointed, God appointed at this time a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided or appointed again, appointed a worm, he appointed another wind, a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. You see this common theme here? God, take my life. I can't stand to see. But wait, it's different. Because this time it's not about mercy. It's to others. It's the fact that God has removed his mercy from Jonah. The second push is God's worm made Jonah squirm. Jonah has been wrestling throughout the narrative between God's justice and God's mercy. How do you balance two? How do you balance the two? There's justice that demands that God that sin be punished. There's mercy that says we all deserve God's punishment, but show some mercy to us, God. Like so many in the world today, he knows that God is a God of love that seeks that none should perish, but that all would have eternal life. But at the same time, he knows that God is a God of justice, that sin should be and must be punished. So how do you balance that too? He's continuing to wrestle with this. And in the middle of the wrestling, God shows Jonah mercy by providing a plant. And he says, God, I'm happy you provided me a plant. But then God says, Hey, I also provided you a worm. And that worm comes up in the next day, and it also says that God sends a scorching east wind. 
Jonah was quick to point out that Nin, what Nineveh deserved, but failed to see what he deserved. Nineveh deserved judgment for evil that they extended to the nations. And that evil had risen before God, and God had commanded Jonah to go that they might repent. It was a nation without regard for human life. It was a nation that could care less what happened to other people. And then what we see in Jonah 4 is the reality of Jonah's heart was also a heart that could care less what happened to other people, only concerned about what happened to him. He was truly as evil as the Ninevites and as guilty and deserving of punishment as the Ninevites. We all deserve God's judgment. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are not distinguished among men that makes us more acceptable or more deserving than someone else. We are guilty and deserving of God's wrath. But God in His compassion and His mercy, He extends grace to us, offering us salvation through Jesus Christ. Not because of what we have done, not because of what we deserve, but because of mercy. And while the plant symbolized God's mercy, the worm symbolizes God's judgment. The mercy God showed Jonah made him rejoice. The worm made him squirm. A number of times in the Bible the word worm is used. One that's very familiar is in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9. Verse 48, the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Speaking of a description of what hell is like. The worms that eat them do not die. It's a picture of God's judgment. Here in Jonah 4, Jonah experiences the judgment of God. And again, notice the shift in attitude. Previously, who wanted to die because God's grace had been extended to Nineveh. Now he wants to die because God's judgment had been extended to him. We've seen how God has been nudging Jonah. He nudged him when he turned from sending, uh, when he turned from sending judgment against Nineveh. Again, God nudged Jonah by sending a worm that symbolized judgment. And now in the final verse, God addresses Jonah. If you look at verse 9, it says, But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Same thing he said before. Why are you so angry? But now he adds the reason. Why are you mad about the plant? And Jonah says, I'm so angry, I wish I would die. Angry about a plant because he lost his comfort. He lost his shade. And the Lord says, you have been concerned about this plant. You did not make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. You know, the picture here is that God does the same thing with nations. Nations rise and nations fall. God brings them up. God brings them down. God is in control. He's the one who appoints things. It says that the nations rose or that the plant sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I, God saying, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people? You're worried about a plant, Jonah, when there are 120,000 people that will face God's judgment if I follow through how you want me to. 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. So in this final section, what we see is that God's address made Jonah reassess. Jonah's concerned about a plant when he should be distressed about a nation. Jonah's concerned about himself while a nation perishes. Worse yet, Jonah's concerned about his personal comfort more than the death of a nation. God describes Nineveh as a city in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell the right from the left. And I don't know, maybe you've heard some people say, well, what they're talking about, they're, they're mentally handicapped, they're not able to, that's not what is being referred to here at all. What, what, is, what God is saying through this verse is not that, but this idea of turning to the right or to the left is Israel's reception of God's word, the Torah, the first five books. They would say, do not depart from it to the right or to the left. What he's saying is there there are 120,000 people who have never heard the word of God, and now I'm extending the mercy that they might receive God's word and respond to it. He also goes on to say that the city is filled with many animals. 
call that in Jonah chapter 3 that the king of Nineveh called for a fast. He said, even the beast of the field will fast. And it's not, it's a picture of God's mercy that extends beyond just you and me, but to the nations as far, and to all of creation. There is God's mercy that is extended to all of creation. Now, you may have noticed that I took some liberty with this last point. If you're looking at your text, you're saying, well, how do you know that Jonah reassessed? The truth is we don't. We don't know what Jonah's response is. I made an assumption. I made the assumption that Jonah reassessed the situation. Of course, what we do see is that the book of Jonah ends with God's address. But what we expect is a response. I mean, the last thing we see here is, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell the right or left, and also many animals, and then you're waiting. Okay, Jonah, what are you going to say? And it doesn't come. It's not. There is no response from Jonah. I don't know if he reassessed. I don't know if Jonah got re-equilibrated. I don't know if Jonah took what he heard and responded in the way that God wanted him to. All I know is that God says it, and I think there's a reason for it. It's because God leaves us in the place that, are you willing to reassess? What about you? Where are you? We don't know if Jonah woke up and smelled the coffee. What we do know is God is leaving us in a place that says, what are you going to do? I think God ends the books so that we can draw our own conclusions. What should I do, God? Is my comfort more important? Is the mercy you extend to me more valuable than the mercy you extend to my neighbors? He's forcing us into the place of personal assessment. And as we close... That was a little premature. We're not closing yet. You, we still got time. You're all getting, you're already packing your bags and putting away your Bibles. I'm sorry. I got you all worked up. We have a few things to talk about in the time that remains. Some observations. First thing is this. Mercy can be seasonal. In Jonah 4, the plant provides to Jonah some shade. But it's only for a short season. In fact, up overnight. And then the shade is taken away by a worm. And if you're familiar with your Bibles, we also see that there's a bigger picture going on here than Jonah saw, because Jonah comes on the scene and he prophesies against Nineveh, the nation of Assyria, and they repent for a season. But then you look at Amos and you look at Hosea, and as you look at those, you see that the nation of Israel is living in sin, and because of that, God is going to raise up a nation that will bring them destruction. And who brings them to destruction? The Assyrians. But then you go a little bit further, and you go to Nahum, and Nahum predicts the destruction again of Nineveh, which eventually comes. And I don't know if that's been your experience in life, but sometimes we experience that mercy is for a season. And here's the point, is that mercy is extended to all of creation, but apart from salvation, it's just seasonal. God brings his reign down on both the believers and the sinners. God causes the vegetation to grow for all of mankind because he seeks that none should perish but that all would have eternal life. But mercy is great, but salvation is the final solution. Have you come to the place in your life that you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior? You may be experiencing good things in your life. In fact, it's often much harder to reach the down and outers, right, than the up and outers. They're still out, but their life is good. They've got the cars, they've got the houses, they've got all the stuff that makes them feel good. God has been merciful to them and given them above and beyond what they could ever hope or imagine. And so they fail to see their need for God. Mercy is good, but salvation is more important because that's eternal. Observation number two, God's justice is often delayed. In 2 Peter 3.9, it says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. It's likely that some of those Ninevites who repented during the time of Jonah found salvation in the Lord. 
Sometimes we wish God would return. It's like, God, come back today, please. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. Come back today. Bring justice and all these people around me that deserve it. I'm sick and tired of this movement and this march and this protest. Bring down your wrath, God. And God says, be patient. I am. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, after this passage in verse 9, after this verse, he goes on to talk about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It will come quickly. So the day of the Lord is coming when judgment will be done justly by God who is a just God. But in the meantime, there are men and women who are coming to faith. And God leaves us here in the meantime that we might share the gospel with others, extend God's grace and mercy to others, that they might know Christ as their Savior. Observation number three. God's commission trumps personal comfort. The difficulty Jonah was having was understanding how God's promises to Israel could be fulfilled if Assyria wasn't punished. Throughout the book of Jonah, there are allusions to God's mission. Again and again, God says, go and go, and it's this allusion to the mission to the nations. It's not just a mission to God's chosen people. It's a mission to the nations. God is Lord over the heavens and all of the earth. Even the cattle respond to God's mercy. The wind, the fish, a plant, another wind, all obey God's appointments. God is Lord over all. You and I are fortunate that God's mercy has extended beyond Israel because if it hadn't, you and I, unless you are a descendant of Abraham, would not be here today to worship God. We can have salvation because God is a God of the nations. And in Acts chapter 1-8, what does Jesus say? He says, you shall be my witnesses from Jerusalem. It starts in Jerusalem with God's chosen people. We can say our mission starts here in the church, but it doesn't stop there. Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Jerusalem is just the beginning. You don't take one without the other. The commission is for inside and outside. It's internal and external. It's both and. It's not either or. God continues to call us to reach those who have not reached him. Why? Because he is patient, willing that none, or desiring that none should perish. God calls us to reach the nations. The last thing is this. God's commission is internal and external. It doesn't stop here. It doesn't stop with just us. It's not just the body of believers. It's the body of believers united for the purpose to pursue the kingdom as we go and tell the nations about God's mercy and grace that he extends and the salvation that he offers through Jesus Christ. This morning, as part of our application... This here is a map of Elkhorn. Those tags, actually there are 11 missing. In the last two weeks there were 29 new residents that moved into the 68022 area code according to the Omaha World Herald paper. 29 in two weeks. That was last Sunday and the Sunday before. 11 of them were taken because somebody's already jumped onto this mission, but here's your mission if you choose to accept it is in the back of the room there are some bags, and those bags are a welcome bag. Not to our church, but to our neighborhood. And there's a thing of popcorn in there. The pot, the, the, or this popped in to say, welcome to the neighborhood. There's also the newcomer paper from uh, Post Gazette. Uh, there's some information about where the emergency rooms are, some information about um, uh, trash pick how to get your trash picked up, some things that new people to the neighborhood might want to know. We're working on getting coupons. We don't have them yet. They're promised. We don't have them in the bags yet. Each of these represents a family that's moving to town. I was told that those 11 people, the tags that were already removed, there were six or seven that were actually home. Two of them moved when he delivered the bags. So it's pretty accurate as far as time frame of people moving in. One house was still being remodeled. It's a simple thing, a, a first step of learning how to share your faith. Hi, welcome to the neighborhood. Glad you're here. Hi, my name's 
I'm from Our Savior's Baptist Church. We just wanted to welcome you to the neighborhood. There used to be a welcome wagon here in Corn. There isn't anymore. Let's be that welcome wagon, huh? It gives them an invitation to church, but it also just gives them some very practical things. And it's an easy thing to say. Hi, my name's Neil. Welcome to the neighborhood. Glad you're here. They might go further and say, oh, nice to meet you. You got kids? Yeah, I got kids. You got kids? You have the conversation, and it goes on. And you develop a relationship. Because that's what evangelism is all about, is developing gospel-centered relationships. We're just building relationships. That's all we're here to do. And we're, through those relationships, showing people what mercy and grace looks like. The mercy and grace that we have received and God, how, how God has transformed our lives. It's not difficult. It's really very simple. So the application today is grab one of these pens off this board. If you live in this neighborhood, this is my neighborhood right here. Looks like I've got some work to do. One, two, three, four. Four new homes in the last two weeks in my neighborhood. 68022. Maybe you don't live in the 68022 area code. The Sunday newspaper, turn to the home section, look over to real estate transfers, find your zip code, find the people who've moved into your neighborhood, take one of those back and say, hi, welcome to the neighborhood. Glad you're here. Piece of cake. Why? Because the nations matter. The people around us matter. And part of the process for Jonah in developing his own sanctification and movement towards what it means to look like God was he learned to share his faith with the nations, or at least was called to share his faith with the nations, and not just be parochial, narrow-minded in his view of who God's favor extends to. He was called to leave his comfort to go to others. What's more important to you? Is it your comfort or is it your call? Are you willing to set aside some of the things that you find comfortable so that others might know Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, for these 29 new residents to the 68022, we pray for your grace and mercy to be shown to them. Even today, I suspect there's another 15 or more people who've moved into the 68022 listed in the newspaper, we pray for them. And for those next week, because people continue to move towards us, may we move towards them. And sometimes it's so easy, Lord, for us to get consumed by our comfort, consumed by our activities, consumed by the things that we're busy with, that we forget to look around us to see how your grace and mercy extends to the nations around us. May we be on mission pursuing the commission which you've given to us. If there's those here today that have never met Christ as their Lord and Savior, they've experienced God's mercy and, and life seems good, but they've never trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, may today be a time that they make the decision to pursue Christ as their Savior, not just as the God who gives them stuff. If that's you today, please come see me and let's have a conversation. Lord, we trust you for these things, and we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen.